Hello and welcome to another episode of On Top of PR. I'm your host, Jason Mudd. We have a great guest today. We are talking uh, about PR measurement and we have connected with the queen of measurement, uh, no other than uh, Katie Payne. And she is gonna have a great conversation with you and me today about the power of PR measurement, uh, why it's important and where to get started. You're gonna really enjoy this episode, especially if you are struggling to measure PR or you just wanna get better at it because I don't think anybody is completely thrilled with how they're measuring PR today. And in this episode, we're gonna help you get there and stay on top of PR. Welcome to On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by Review Maxer. Hello and welcome to another episode of On Top of PR. I'm your host, Jason Mudd with Axia Public Relations. And today we have a special guest, Katie Payne. Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. We're glad you're here too, and I'm glad to be here. I'll tell you, I, um, you and I have never crossed paths before. This is actually the first time we're, we're meeting. And I'm very excited about that because you've got a great reputation in the industry. And um, uh, our mutual friend, Jonna Burke, who has been a guest on this show previously, um, you know, I think we kind of made a reference to her during our episode that, uh, you know, she was the queen of PR measurement. And she said, oh, no, 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 I do not deserve that title. It belongs to Katie Payne. And, um, and so I'd certainly, uh, you know, heard your name in the business before, but never had an opportunity to connect with you. And what better way to do it in a live uh, recorded uh, conversation here? And uh, we can get to know each other a little bit better through our time together today. Does, does that sound good to you? It sounds great to me, yeah. Good, good. Well, uh, Katie, why don't you give our audience just a little bit of background of, uh, you know, who you are and what you do and um, your career and, and success in, in the public relations profession? So, so first of all, I want to tell everybody that the reason I'm the measurement queen is because I started out in life as a reporter and an Asian studies, Asian history major. So <laughs> I went to work in Silicon Valley and I was completely, you know, ineffectual as a communications person because everybody around me was talking in charts and graphs and data. And I suddenly had an aha moment where I said, oh, if I just translate my words into numbers or charts or data, to listen to me and they did <laughs> and they gave me a budget and you know I went on to Hewlett Packard and and Lotus Development and and all these things and I kept measuring stuff as I went along and then um, at some point along the way I decided I really was genetically unemployable I was not cut out for corporate America and I um, I had just finished this project where where I was under tremendous fire. I was the ninth director of corporate communications in five years, so I knew I was going to get fired. So I did this whole <laughs> measurement project where I looked. I knew that the goal was to get our messages out to key people, and you know, ultimately convince them to buy more Lotus products. And so I read everything, and I eventually hired somebody to to help me deal with it. But we read like twenty four hundred articles and evaluated each one based on whether it left you more or less likely to buy the product. Mm -hmm. And I showed it to my agency and everybody else in the in the company. And the agency head, Bob Straton at the time, said, uh, you know, anybody who's not using this by the year 2000 doesn't deserve to be in business. So I said, okay, and I quit and started the Delahaye Group, which was my first company. Uh, sold that and um, then started another one, which was supposed to be kind of an educational measurement newsletter company and consulting company. But I very quickly got dragged back into the measurement space, and that was Katie Payne and Partners. And Delahaye eventually became Cision. Katie Payne and Partners eventually became Karma. Um, and then in 2013, I decided I really didn't want to ever have another employee, and I really didn't want to have another company. I just wanted to help people figure out what to measure and how to measure it and and to write about it and so we started pain publishing i started pain publishing in 2013 and we published a newsletter entirely devoted to measurement and i conduct training courses and seminars and conferences about measurement and then uh, we do a lot of ebooks and and that kind of thing and then i have clients who basically come to me and say I need to measure something, help me figure out how. And what I do is I work with them to identify the connection between their bottom line and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that becomes metrics and that becomes a measurement dashboard. 
Well, that's fantastic. And that's exactly what we want to accomplish today is helping our audience understand how to measure and that it's something that is obviously, uh, you know, can be done, should be done. And, uh, and, and maybe uh, you might be willing to share some rough blueprint of how to do it. Of course, everything, every measurement case is unique, but there are certainly some commonalities and similarities. So uh, I'd like to rewind just a minute. And you said, you expressed at some point that someone said to you, if, if companies weren't using this by the year, I think you said 2000, yeah. then something to the effect they probably would be out of business or should be out of business. So what exactly did you put together? And do you see that being embraced uh, in corporate communications today? Yeah, I mean, basically what I put together is exactly what every measurement dashboard put out there by Precision Meltwater, Talkwater or whatever. Mm -hmm now shows today. I mean, not everybody's using them, obviously, but but essentially all we did was, you know, take positive, negative, and neutral. We defined it differently. We basically said positive was leaves you more likely to um, mm -hmm. buy the product. And, right. and we had human beings back then because nobody had AI or machines or anything else. It was basically we had human beings with Excel spreadsheets going through and reading articles. And, um, and that's what we did. And since then, you know, then the goal was, of course, to get positive press. Today, what you really have to do is get people to define what senior leadership views as the role of communications, mm -hmm. in, you know, in the bottom line. And so you right. start with, okay, how do these people out there who sign your paychecks and the boards of directors and whatever it happens to be, but what do they perceive as your role in the business process? Mm -hmm. And that's always an interesting one because a lot of people think, you know, generating good press, okay, fine. Then how does that help the business? You know, you sort of really have to work right. people back and forth. And then ultimately to, to come up with something that, that you know, connects. And it's what I call basically, you know, acceptable proxies, right? I mean, maybe positive articles are, are are acceptable proxies or maybe the lack of negative articles is the acceptable mm -hmm. proxy or right. maybe traffic to the website, whatever it happens to be. So it can be absolutely anything today. Back then, you know, it really was about just the positive press. And then to a certain extent, it was did the messages, did the stories contain the messages and then did we reach the influencers? Because back then it was all about, you know, industry analysts and mm -hmm. were they echoing our messages? So right. that's basically it's getting the, the, the bosses to agree that this is what you're trying to do. Yeah. And so, Katie, where do you see the, uh, the future of PR measurement? Where do we go from here now that there's been a over, you know, overall adoption of some basic measurement uh, tools and techniques? Well, I think that is a, that's a funny thing. We just spent uh, about an hour talking about that at our Summit on the Future of Measurement, debating what the future was. Um, I, let me go back a year. A year okay. ago, everybody was like, oh, it's all going to be about AI. And yeah, there were a lot of companies talking about using machine learning and AI, and I was highly skeptical. And I basically said, I think it's that's all a bunch of hooey um, in more salty language perhaps <laughs> and um, and then uh, I said you know AI isn't going to help until it tells your basic PR person a there's a crisis coming this is the type of crisis it's going to be C this is your best response based on the best you know crisis communications theory and you know here's what worked in the past and uh, Gagger and Oliver of Full Intel called me up a week later and said, we can do that. So we did this whole experiment working with Professor Coombs, Tim Coombs, who actually wrote crisis communications theory. And, uh, and sure enough, they taught a machine how to identify the crisis and the type of crisis and the best response. Hmm. And so I've, I've changed my mind. <laughs> I've been converted. <laughs> I really do think that that AI and machine learning can go a long way to both fix the accuracy problems in measurement because there's a tremendous amount of accuracy problems. Um, I think it 
it can go a long way for speeding up the response times to things. Mm -hmm. But a big part of it, and it's funny, I'm doing a thing on AI later on this week, and the, the big issue here is that it's not so much that AI and machine learning are going to replace human beings, right? It's that they're going to produce, measurement is producing today, the data to convince senior leadership to do the right, right thing and to stop doing the stupid stuff. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, you, you hear this all the time, right? That, you know, when, whenever there's a horrible crisis and, and, you know, companies are just doing really stupid things. Mm -hmm. I always have this vision of the entire PR and comms and public affairs people bound, gagged, and handcuffed in the basement, tied to shackles, <laughs> screaming at the top of their lungs, don't do that. And the lawyers have the key, right? Yeah, and right. so what, what AI and data and measurement can do today is – you know, release the shackles, let those people out and say, hey, lawyers, it's not going to work. Right. And the example that we did was in this in this experimental um, study we did was that you could just see that when the companies in these, we looked at three self-inflicted crises, uh, uh, a particular airplane that kept falling out of the skies, uh, <laughs> we work that kept falling out of the sky, right. uh, and, a, and a toddler death. And it was all self-inflicted crises. And mm -hmm. every single time, if you said, and this is the beautiful chart, it basically said, if you say no comment, if you blame the victim, you know, Boeing blamed the pilots, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you blame the victim, if you say no comment, if you dodge the press, the time it's going to take you to get from a whole bunch of negative press back down to neutral is a lot longer. Mm. And so we, we used a metric called time to neutrality, which is from the peak negative stop down to neutral. Okay. And how long did it take? Well, you, I mean, you can do that manually. It's going to take it's a lot of data and it's going to take you a lot of time, but AI can do that instantly. So it's going to provide data to communications folks. It's going to make it easier to get that data and then show that data to the people who are making stupid decisions mm -hmm. and keeping them bound and handcuffed and, and <laughs> you know, and, and gagged in the basement. Nice. Well, that's a very colorful answer. I love it. Um, so let's start with uh, the corporate communications uh, leader or maybe even uh, manager entry level person who, you know, they've got, uh, you know, I'll use a real life example. You know, many years ago, I was working uh, with a Fortune 1000 company and their measure of PR success was how many news releases did we send out? Right. I mean, it was that basic. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, uh, the clients that, you know, the client contacts we reported to were bonused on this. And yeah. so there was some sort of bonus scale. So, of course, they were announcing every conference that they were speaking at. Uh, they were announcing every donation they made. I mean, it was just, you know, and so but they got it. They understood at least at that level of there was some news that we were just putting on the website to check a box and say we did it. And there was, you know, other news that we were truly out there pitching media and trying to line up interviews for. Yeah. But let's just say that's kind of the worst case scenario, right? Uh, if somebody comes in and that's where they are today and they, and they say leadership's vision of PR is volume of announcements, right? Uh, I know that's not great, uh, says the client, right? Uh, says the corporate communicator. Uh, I'm currently reporting on how many releases we sent out and how much it was picked up basically, you know, vanity metrics or, you know, almost useful information. Uh, where would activity. you kind of, we call them activity metrics? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Where would you encourage them to begin moving the conversation and, you know, managing their management, right? Or, you know, kind of guiding their management through that? Where, you know, where would be a good place for them to start if they really don't have much traction there? Well, the, the big thing is, is to is to bring in other data, right? So mm -hmm. if you do that and you say, okay, I increased the volume of my press release distribution by 20%. Mm -hmm. 
what happened to your messages? Did your messages also go up by 20% out there in the world? Right. Did people get your messages more? What happened on your website? Did people actually go to your website to find out more? Now, I, and I'm not saying, because there's a wonderful Sodexo case study where they did exactly that. They sent out a press release a day for like three weeks. But each one was designed not to get press. It right. was designed to boost Google search on certain topics, mm -hmm. right? And it worked and they got sales out of it. But the goal was sales leads, not not press. Not earned media coverage. Not sure. earned media coverage. And so, I mean, you've got to work backwards from literally the CEO or somebody to say, what do you think this earned media? I mean, go find somebody in the finance department and, and get, get their help with their data. But if you're doing all that stuff, you're pushing out all those press releases and you can't show that either more people went to your website or you're getting more messages out there or even just getting more positive press or getting more exposure for the things you want to get exposure for, uh, re uh, boosting your, your Google, your SEO, your search mm -hmm. engine rankings, mm -hmm. um, or boosting your stock price. I mean, if it doesn't do any of those things, why don't they just fire the entire PR department because it's obviously not bringing in any revenue and it's not contributing to anything. It's not even like you could say a long-term perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, maybe fine. Then Mark Stuce has a great product that, that automatically time shifts all these things. So it'll take your stock price and your, your Google analytics and all that data and all the activities you do and it automatically does correlations and time shifts everything huh. and and it's called proof analytics and it's quite amazing but but what happens is is the fact that they say okay you're doing this now it's not going to pay off for 11 months hmm. or you could do this over here and it's going to pay off in three months choose wisely very Make good choices. My favorite, my my favorite is a jo L. George Jones songs, but basically it's called Good Choices. And and you know you sort of look at people and you say, here's the data. You could do this or you could do that. Right. Make good choices. Yeah. There you go. Very nice. Well, with that, we're going to take a quick break and come back on the other side with more with Katie Payne. You're listening to On Top of PR with your host Jason Mudd. Jason is a trusted advisor to some of America's most admired and fastest growing brands. He is the managing partner at Axia Public Relations, a PR agency that guides news, social, and web strategies for national companies. And now, back to the show. Welcome back. Uh, I'm Jason Mudd. I'm joined today with Katie Payne, and we are having an excellent conversation about PR measurement. Uh, probably one of the most important conversations that a PR practitioner could be having, especially if you're not yet measuring PR or you're not yet demonstrating sound measurement in your PR practices. And, and I'd just like to encourage our audience to keep in mind, that's okay. You have to start somewhere. And um, you know, there's going to be some companies that are uh, leading the way, and there's going to be many other companies that are very far behind. And I see that uh, differentiation every day when I'm talking to other corporate communicators and PR leaders. Um, you know, some just aren't on the measurement bus yet, and uh, others are trying to find the bus and the best route, and others are on the bus and enjoying it. And so what, no matter where you are, Katie and I want to help you get there today. And so we're having a great conversation about uh, PR measurement. Um, Katie, we were just talking kind of a little bit about, you know, what you can do, how you can align with, uh, with leadership, how you can demonstrate, you know, what the data is telling you and make, you know, wise decisions from that data. Um, and I agree with you. I think that, you know, not only do you have to understand what the leadership team, how they view PR and what they're looking for from corporate communications, uh, but, you know, one thing we try to do is always align our, our, our communications goals with the company's goals, you know, so that whatever the company's trying to accomplish this quarter, this year, over the next three years, that PR and corporate communications is in lockstep with those uh, guidance. Um, what are your thoughts on that approach? Well, I think the, the big thing is, is that we have more tools. I mean, you know, as an agency, as, as a department, whatever, they have more, they have access to more tools than ever before 
to get messages out there, to get, you know, to, to position themselves on issues, to whatever the goal happens to be. There's lots of different ways to do that. And, you know, frankly, compared to, you know, paid advertising in the Wall Street Journal, it all seems cheap at, at some point. But the reality is, is the fact that you've got communications teams out there and PR teams and their agencies that are, you know, sort of always working at capacity, always, you know, long hours. And you need to know what the most efficient use of those resources is, it being, you know, bodies or brains or budget. Mm -hmm. You need to know what the most efficient use is. So what you need to do is you need to come up with that goal, right? That, you know, here's your champagne moment. Here's the thing that is going to get you the boss's boss's walking into your office and plunking a case of champagne down on your desk because you've done such a fabulous job. I love well, that champagne moment. I'm the champagne that moment <laughs> isn't going to happen unless you know what that goal is in the minds of the board, right. the CEO, the boss's mm -hmm. boss. So you can be having your own champagne and they're like, yeah. why are you celebrating this? It doesn't mean anything to us. It right? happens all the time. I mean, I see that yeah. all the time of people saying, hey, we got a lot of likes and, you know, we raised the number of follower counts. But if that's right. not what, you know, if that's not what is perceived as your job or your role, then it's not going to work. So the the important thing is, is get agreement on that champagne moment on whatever it is that you're all mm -hmm. working towards. And it's typically... You know, it's a strategic priority, it's a strategic positioning, it's a whatever it is, you know, it doesn't, it's not always, um, you know, dollars and cents, but mm -hmm. it's something that contributes to the bottom line. And then you work backwards, you come up with, as I call them, acceptable proxies. Okay. And then you have to be very realistic that, for instance, if the goal is, I want to increase trust in our brand, right? Well, yeah, you can read social media and maybe if you're really good and have a really super duper system and a whole bunch of really smart humans, you might be able to figure out trust, right? Mm -hmm. Cost you maybe a million dollar system, but hey, hey whatever. <laughs> or you do a survey and the survey questions are already written. There's been, you know, tons of research over the years on what trust is and the components of trust and I've mm -hmm. written, you know, guidelines for measuring trust, the survey questions are already written. They're out there. They're on my website. They're all over the place. Take four or five of those questions and, you know, do a Google form survey mm -hmm. and send them out to the stakeholders and figure out whether they trust you now mm -hmm. and the level of trust now. Mm -hmm. And then you do it again after your campaign or you do it again after six months and you say, okay, have we raised the trust level? Right. But that kind of thinking is everybody wants like, I want something right now. So I'm going to go on to my, you know, media measurement dashboard and come up with a chart. Well, mm -hmm. if it doesn't relate back down to that champagne moment, you're not going to convince anybody of anything. Yeah, you're spinning your wheels unnecessarily. Totally. Spin so what you really want to do is you want to be able to say, okay, I'm doing these five things. And these five things are, are, are generating search engine, you know, rankings, better search engine rankings or leads or visits or length of duration of the visits or follow whatever it happens to be, whatever right. those agreed upon proxies are. And then you say, okay, now we've all agreed. This is the champagne moment. Which of these things are contributing more and what is the resource behind it? Because this is the other thing that PR and communications doesn't do very often, which is to put a resource number against it, right? And it's not just budget, right? It's not just, I spent this much money on an agency and therefore I got this much back or I didn't get this much back. It's, you know, the, the bodies and the effort and the energy. And so that's why I call it a resource number. And, and basically on a scale of one to 10, mm -hmm right? Uh, with 10 being total pain in the neck, to be polite. <laughs> I call it a PETA, PETA number. Your PETA right. number is, oh my God, we've been sleeping on the floor for the last week and a half getting this damn thing out the door to complete easy peasy. Okay. Right? So you, all those little things that you do, all the campaign, whatever it right. happens to be, you give it a, a resource ranking, and then you look at the overall results and that results is whether it's, you know, 
clicks or opens or or positive coverage or messages communicated or a, a quality overall quality score and I'll talk about that in a minute but whatever that result is you put that on a on a grid right like this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so the you know you look at the uh, low resources low resources high results do more of that right high resources low results stop doing the stupid stuff <laughs> right it's not that complicated but it's it's reframing the conversation around from the activity metrics like you were talking about mm -hmm. to activity metrics plus resources mm -hmm. to the results and how do they come up with that how do you how do you figure out uh, what those resources are uh, well that's the easy part I think but then figuring out uh, where those activities are yielding the type of results you're looking yeah. for. Well, the, that gets into the definition. And, and what I basically force on my clients is, is what I call a definition of good, right? Good results. What's a good mm -hmm. result? I mean, in right. PR, it's generally a combination of, you know, visibility. You know, is it mm -hmm. head, does it mention your brand in the headline? Uh, is it by somebody influential, right? Is it in a is it in a media outlet of some sort that's going to influence anybody that you care about? Is it about something you care about? Does it contain your key message? Does it leave you more likely to do business with the company or work for the company or recommend the company or whatever it is? Or or does it leave you less likely to oppose? And I think a lot of PR today is is you know I call it the the reducing the number of pitchforks at your gate. I mean, that's the <laughs> right. whole, you know, CSR, CSA stuff. But, you know, sometimes you're just trying to reduce opposition. Whatever that goal is, you basically define this, what I call a quality score, and you do it for earned media, you do it for social media, you can do it for internal, you can do it for external, you can create these definitions of good. And then that becomes your metric. Mm -hmm. And what I find is, is it's amazing how 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 different or 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 quirky in some cases each different client of mine's definition of good can be. Right, it's very right? relative. Yeah, and but it has to be relative to your own objectives and company and organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it's share of voice, right? I mm -hmm. mean, a share of voice may just be. You know, I raise my share of voice this month, right. or share of desirable voice as opposed mm -hmm. to overall share. Of right. Voice. <laughs> um, whatever that number is, that's that's what you put that's what you put numbers around. So you get your resource, you know, judgment call, right? Paying mm -hmm. next to to easy peasy, and then you get you know good versus bad, but you have to put the definitions around it. Right. Absolutely. And the, um, challenge, the challenge with PR, and, and I, I, I beat people up on this all the time because, you know, if you look at like the, the population of PRSA, it's something like 60% nonprofits and small shops, right? right. It's, not, it's not Procter & Gamble and Unilever, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to make all of this stuff specific to your CEO or your CMO or your organization or your stakeholders because there is no one size fits all. Right. Uh, by the way, you threw out a couple acronyms. One was PRSA, and I assume yeah. many of our mem out of our audience knows that that's the Public Relations Society of Thank America. You. you also threw out uh, CSR, which I assume stands for Corporate Social Responsibility. Correct. And CSA, uh, would Corporate that be Corporate? Right. Corporate social advocacy. Advocacy, yeah. I was going to guess so, that, but I didn't want to make any assumptions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so a lot of the CSR stuff that that CSR became, you know, this social responsibility stuff. It grew out of the the um, a lot of the work that I was doing back in the I don't know early two thousands, um, late nineties. Um, but corporate social advocacy really, you know, the the Nike Kaepernick thing kind of stuck the the stake in the ground and said, okay, this is what corporate advocacy is supposed to do. And oh, by the way, it sold a lot of sneakers. Um, and we had a whole session at it at at our measurement summit last week, and um, 
it's very tricky and a lot of times you know it's it's hard to it's hard to navigate but it's not hard to measure because basically mm -hmm. ultimately what you want to know is did that advocacy a appear authentic did it raise your trust levels and did it make anybody want to do business with you more often right that's very good i love that very clear concise and focused uh you know kind of evaluation type questions for really any campaign or even communication that you might send out there so yeah well katie uh we are starting to run short on time this has been a wonderful conversation you have a couple of uh opportunities where uh folks can connect with you including uh subscribing to your email checking out your ebooks and uh and possibly signing up or exploring some conferences that you offer what's the best way for people to not only find out more about those opportunities but specifically to get connected to you um it's very easy my email is measurementqueen at gmail.com that's very easy <laughs> so that's easy to remember and the website is painpublishing.com and the newsletter is the measurement advisor um and it comes out roughly once a month but it's uh it is a subscription-based newsletter but most of it is free it's basically we put numbers on we put a, a paywall on a couple of things because mm -hmm. that pays the editors and you know keeps us all alive and pays my right. bills um and and you know that you think back on it we started that in 2013 and we've actually had a subscription-based newsletter since 2013 and it's um we haven't raised the price um but if you subscribe you get content from whatever that is seven years of measurement articles wow. so pretty okay. much in this actually this issue that's coming out this week literally every question anybody's asked me over the years mm -hmm. will be answered somewhere in that newsletter <laughs> i basically that's said great. let's just answer everybody's questions and put it all in one place so that's um, great yeah that'll be a very popular resource yeah. i'm sure and uh we'd be thrilled to put some links in the show notes to where people can go to opt in to uh uh, these resources for them to learn more. And we also do, we also do um, uh, uh, three or four a year, what I call measurement base camp. Okay. So if you're listening to this and going, oh God, I don't even know where to start, whatever. Uh, we do a series of sessions on how to do surveys, how to do, uh, how to use pivot tables, um, how to use Google Analytics, how to use all of these tools that are out there and free mm -hmm. um, and really help. And they're not really all that horrible and complicated and confusing when you explain them pretty simply. So we do a day on each one and it's basically, it turns out it's very popular. People really like it um, because people really get their questions answered about, you know, what's a pivot table and how do I use it? Right, right. Excellent. Little basic things like that. Well, Katie, this has been incredible. You were a great guest. I love what we talked about here today. I know our audience picked up a lot of information about public relations measurement and the importance of it and some practical tips they can take away for where to get started. So thank you so much for being a great guest. It was an honor to have you and I'm excited to have you back in the future where we can dive into this topic even more. Folks, if you enjoyed hearing from Katie today, I, I would appreciate if you would connect with her through her website and subscribe to her newsletter. Speaking of subscribing, if you like what you heard today, please subscribe to our uh, vodcast or podcast on whatever platform it is that you're consuming it. Uh, we really appreciate your comments and ratings and feedback and requests. So connect with us, stay in touch, and uh, we're going to produce many more episodes just like this that will be very valuable to you and your profession and your employer and clients. So thanks for tuning in. This has been On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by Review Maxer. 